Hey, uh, Dave, I was wondering if you could run us through the, the change of going from the booth to the sideline, uh, how that helped you or, and, and what changes you saw when you were down there on the sideline. Yeah, that's something that we've been talking about, you know, over the course of the year. We, we really started talking about it back at the beginning of the year, especially with, you know, having a, a younger quarterback playing. And, um, you know, we just had had that, that break there where we just kind of felt that that was going to be the best situation moving forward. We shuffled some guys around, um, you know, staff-wise. And, um, you know, I do, you know, it's a different game when you're on the field. For me, I personally like being on the field. I like being in the mix. Um, I've played quarterback since I was nine years old. I get a good feel for the juice of the game. I get a good feel for the movement of the game. Um, some guys call the game a little bit better or a little bit easier if they're in the box and they have their plan and they're kind of sitting there drinking Diet Coke and they you know, can you know, have a more of a scientific feel for it. Um, that's not really how I do it. I kind of um, just kind of get a feel for what they're doing and know exactly where we want to go and what we want to do. Um, you know, the drawback is that, you know, if you, if you don't get great information from the guys in the booth, um, then, you know, sometimes you could be shooting in the dark, but that wasn't the case at all. We had great communication, guys, you know, relayed great information to me. Um, but for me, I think it's, it's easier to be impactful, uh, certainly on the quarterback, but, you know, I'm able to, to impact um, all of the groups and, you know, get in there and say, hey, this is what's coming up or this is what you need to look at or, or you know, certain things that we're, you know, we're thinking about or, you know, motivate or get after somebody or whatever. Um, and so I, I think that that's, you know, for me, that's it's a good feel. Uh, I like being in the mix. I like being in the energy of the game. Um, so, you know, certainly, you know, the, it was a positive outcome. So, um but I, I do think it's a different deal. I think it just plays to my, to my strong suit a little bit better. Next question comes from Kelly Quinlan from Rivals. Hey, Dave. I was just curious what you've seen from NC State on, and their defense this year. It seems like they've had some good games against some of the, the better offenses in the league. Mm -hmm. Well, they're very similar schematically to what they were doing last year. Um, they are a three down front. Their nose guard is, is a, he's a real, you know, real plugger, big dude. Um, so you have to really, um, know where he is in the run game. He does a really good job of, of playing, um, on the center and trying to bully the center around, um, and anchor the middle of the defense. And, and that's critical if you're a three down defense, they do a really good job with that. Um, they are not overcomplicated, um, from a pass standpoint, you know, they play a lot of single high safety. They're going to overload the box just like, you know, everybody else has over the past, uh, you know, a few, few weeks, few games. Um, but they're doing it out of an odd package, and they have a lot of moving parts. Um, and, and when they blitz, they're very effective. Um, and then they play a bunch of zone defense, you know. So um, unlike, the, you know, unlike Duke, who was going to get up and press you, almost every play, these guys are probably playing a little bit more off coverage, keeping things in front of them a little bit more. Um, but they create a lot of different angles, run blocking and things like that because of the odd front that they play. Um, they tackle well and they're physical. And I think that that's been the thing that, that has stood out to me. The linebacker play, the D-line play, uh, when they get a shot at you, they try, they try to take a shot at you. Um, and they're, they're pretty firm tacklers in there. So. Um, you know, again, they're going to try to overload us, especially after we had a good night running the ball. I'm sure that they're going to try to overload the box and get the safeties down in there and try to get extra hats in there. And, and you know, um, this is definitely a different chess match than it was last week. It was, it's a different defense. I think that's the cool thing about this league is you get a lot of different looks. You get a lot of different, um, very well-coached defenses. Um, and schematically, they're, they're a different challenge. So, uh, you know, that's the fun part when you put the tape on on Sunday afternoon and you start watching them and, and saying, well, you know, these are the type of plays that you can run and these are the, you know, these are the guys that we think we have to attack. So um, they've done a really nice job. They, they're, they're very well coached and, I, you know, it's going to be a fun day. Question from Ken Segura from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Hey, Dave, I had a question for you about uh, Jalen Camp, and I was curious just how you've seen him progress last year to this year. He's, he's also having a really nice season for you. 
Well, he's healthy, right? Last year he was, you know, he's, he was hobbled along for, for most of the year, and then he had to, uh, you know, he had to, um, you know, miss the, the remainder of the year at the end of the year and, and, and get, his, get himself fixed up. So he's much more explosive now uh, without dealing with the lower body injury. So, you know, he's able to stack on top of people. He's a really good route runner. Um, and the biggest thing with him is you can't move him off his path as easily because he's very strong. Um, so he has a really good idea of, of how to run routes. You know, he's an older guy, he's a veteran guy, um, and he takes coaching really well, you know. And, um, you know, even in the meetings, he, he really understands concepts, he understands coverages. Um, so he, he does a really good job of knowing where we're going to throw the ball, getting to that, that, getting to that point. Um, and he has really, really strong hands. Uh, the, the catch that he made on the touchdown, um, you know, that was not a textbook throw by Jeff. Jeff kind of saw the coverage and they over rotated a little bit. So he threw the ball back into the middle of the field a little bit more. And Jalen had to go in there and pull that ball off his shoestring. So, um, you know, really good adjustment to the ball. He has really, really good um, hands and he understands his body placement and how to use his body. Um, which, you know, I, I heard Andrew talking a little bit earlier about NC State's guys catching the ball. Like when you look across college football, there's so many drop balls um, because guys don't use great technique um, or they don't frame the ball very well. They don't watch the ball in the whole way. You know, you're catching the ball with, their, your, with your eyes first and bringing your hands to your eyes. Um, guys kind of like take it for granted a little bit. And um, we've caught the ball really well this year. And, and you know, Jalen's very confident and letting the ball get close to his body and using his hands, where a lot of guys, when they're a little bit younger, kind of body the ball up and try to play it off their pads a little bit more. He doesn't allow the ball to get into him like that. So he's been very productive, especially on balls over the top. Another question from the AJC, this time from Bailey Johnson. Hey, Dave. I'm just wondering, sort of now that you've seen most of the teams in the league, either in games or on film, sort of your impressions of the overall ACC picture and where you think you guys fit into that. Well, I, I heard that. I heard that uh, that question with Andrew Bailey. So I got my I got a good you know preparation on that. But um, you know, uh, two of the teams in the league are, are at the top of the uh, at the top of the country. I, you know, I think Clemson and Notre Dame have established themselves you know very you know very well and and uh, have a legitimate chance at the national championship. Um, you know, I think we can be right in that next level of, of teams um, in this league that. Uh, could beat anybody on on any given week. I think there is a lot of parity. Um, you know, some of the other teams like Miami and North Carolina are still you know ranked uh, you know very high. But you know, when you put the tape on and you watch Virginia, Virginia Tech, Louisville, Boston College, Syracuse, I mean, everybody's got guys that can play. Everybody's good schematically. Um, you know, our our team's staying healthy, um, and really, our team's able to handle this whole grind of this season with the COVID and and you know not playing and then we are playing and we're not playing and um you know who's the opponent and um you know being tested and and all of those type of things and it takes a lot of perseverance you know we, we talked to the guys uh this morning uh, the offensive guys about you know listen this is a mental game at this point right like we understand how to block inside zone you know we understand how to run a dig shallow combination right now um but you know just your energy and uh, you know, staying with it emotionally and mentally um, over the course of this season, uh, and I give our guys a lot of credit that they're they're very strong-willed, and they showed great perseverance on Saturday. And I think the teams that are able to do that and then withstand, you know, some injuries that you know people are going to lose some guys, and um, you know, being able to develop guys in the program, and and you know, it becomes a culture thing at that point. Like teams that play well at the end of the season have a strong culture, right? They believe in what's going on. They believe in the staff. They believe in their head guy. They believe in the guys next to them. They like playing. They like showing up in the building um, and, and being able to go out and compete. And, you know, I think that uh, when we do the things that we're capable of doing across the board, and the defense played fantastic and set us up all night against Duke, when we play complimentary football like that, we're very tough to beat. Time for a couple more for Coach uh, Pat Note, and we'll start with another one from Rod McKenzie. Hey, Coach, your your offensive line, you know, with uh, 
the five guys cross the front. Of, they've been Ironmen throughout most of the year. Uh, Duke game, you you got to see a little bit more of Kenny Cooper and, and Charlie Clark at, over mm-hmm. in tackle. What did you see from those two guys, and how did that help the offensive line? Well, I, I think that those guys have been those guys have been awesome. I mean, Zach Quinney was the player of the week in the league and got the accolades. But when you put the tape on those guys, set the table. I think any good offense, and we've talked about this since day one, is going to start in the toughness and the tenacity and the workmanship, the work ethic. That all starts with the big guys up front. Um, and, you know, it takes uh, a lot off my plate, right, if we can – um, you know, bang the ball in there for 300 yards rushing, right? Then, then that takes a little bit of pressure off of Jeff. It sets up your play action. Um, and those guys have a workman um, mindset. Brent does a great job with those guys, just instilling confidence, instilling toughness, um, inst- instilling a mindset that we're going to come and work every day. Um, and, you know, they did a really good job protecting. We talked last week about, you know, Duke's – uh, defensive line and um, they got a little bit of pressure on us they made a couple of, of nice little nice little moves and Jeff got us out of trouble a couple times and but for the most part we handled them you know well in the past game and then we laid on them and and we continued to um, pound on them in, you know uh, into the second half and then we just wore them down you know and when you get the lead and you can run the ball and you can wear them out and burn clock uh, and not put the defense back on the field, that's huge, you know. And um, I can't say enough about those guys. They've been in there. And, you know, Kenny went in. Uh, I think he played like 30 plays. Charlie played 30 plays. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to find, you know, five, six, seven guys, you know, that could go in there and, and, and give – those other guys a little bit of a break and develop some depth. So I was really happy with Charlie. He, you know, he got in there and, you know, he battled and, um, you know, it was a tough task and he jump set that guy, number 51. He got it. He's got his hands on him and, and uh, did a good job. And that let Jordan kind of uh, get into the flow of the game a little bit too. So, you know, it was a plan that we were going to try to mix a few guys in coming off the break. Okay, time for two more for Coach. Uh, we'll start with Kelly Quinlan, and then we'll uh, wrap up with Ken Segura. So, Kelly, go ahead. Obviously, with the, uh, Marion down, you, you had to kind of adjust. PJ got a lot of play, and, and Nate got in there as well. And I'm just kind of curious what you're seeing from that slot position right now with, with uh, some adjustments there with the Marion not playing. Yeah, they're two totally different dudes, right? PJ's a bigger-bodied guy, um, really good in a run game, has a really good feel uh, for you know, he has really good spatial awareness. You know, obviously, no nobody runs like you know A B. So um, you lose that you know that explosive down the field, um, just throw it as far as you can throw it type mentality. Um, but he's really good at leaning on people and bodying people up. He's a bigger bodied slot uh, with very sure hands, and he's very smart. He understands exactly kind of where he fits in. Uh, to the pass game. Uh, and then Nate is the totally opposite. Nate's a littler dude, explosive, fast, good linear speed, gives us a little bit more burn, a little bit more um, down the field. You could go get it type mentality. Um, so the combination of those guys with the speed sweeps and, um, you know, the guy coming out of the backfield and, and um, you know, running some of those one-on-one routes that we had to run against Duke, I thought that they handled themselves really well. Uh, you know, AB's a really good player, but you have to play with the guys that you have, and that's what we talk about all the time. It's the next man up mentality and understand exactly what you're doing. Don't try to do more than you're asked to do. Don't try to do more than you have to do. Um, and, you know, the great thing was that they were in the right spot every play, right? They didn't bust. Um, they ran good routes. The ball didn't find them as much um, in that game. But, um, you know, I was happy with their tenacity, how they played, how they blocked, um, and their, you know, their ability to execute. So, um, you know, they set us up really well. Okay, final question for Coach Pat Note from Ken Segura. Um, in the game, obviously, Dante came in and played really well for you. Um, and I'm curious, obviously, I'm not knowing what your situation is running back. How do you, and I guess potentially Jemias could come back in the mix too. How, do, how does that impact the way you plan and, and know, kind of figure out how to use those guys? Yeah, well, we've talked about it all year. The, the great thing about that position is there's great depth. You know, the thing that I love about Dante is like, um, you know, he doesn't play for like a quarter and a half and then he goes in and he's like the energizer bunny. You know, he just flies around. Um, the thing that's really deceptive about Dante is he's really electric fast. 
Um, and you, you saw on a couple of those touchdown runs, he kind of bounced that one and he went around the horn on one. Um, and, you know, a lot of backs could kind of break it in and make somebody miss. But the one that he split down the middle of the field, both of those safeties had angles on him. And he, he split those guys and he dropped the hammer and he was gone. You know, so he's got like race car, you know, race car quicks um, where he can um, get to his top speed in a couple steps and be gone. So I think that's a little deceptive with him where, you know, a lot of guys on the team, well, that guy's really fast, that guy's really fast. But if you line those guys up in a 40, uh, Dante will be, you know, one of the three or four fastest guys on the team. So that gives us a little bit different look, you know, because we were pounding on him with JP and wearing him out, wearing him out, wearing him out. And then, you know, Dante comes in. And if you're a defender and you don't know that quickness and that ability to get to top end speed very quickly, um, you know, that's, that's a little bit of a change up and, and they weren't ready for it. Um, and then, you know, like I said, we do have great depth at that position. We'll continue to roll those guys in. Uh, Jemias is back being healthy now. He'll be back in the mix. And, and uh, you know, we just continue to roll those guys through. We kind of see exactly what they give us, what their role is, and what the plays are that they're really good at running, and then try to frame it up so that when I know that, hey, these guys are in the game, um, you know, well, maybe we should call these type of plays as opposed to, you know, to something else. And, and we have a plan, you know, for the week that says, all right, when, when, you know, we're in this personnel grouping and this guy's in, these are the plays that we should lean heavy on. And that's kind of what we did on Saturday night.